A friend of mine who had notoriously bad recommendations when it comes to film recently recommended me The Queen's Gambit, a Netflix miniseries about an orphan and child prodigy obsessed with chess. He described it as, well, a show about chess. I was curious not because of the concept, but because the first question I had was, how do you make a show about chess interesting? Let me be clear, I'm not saying that chess isn't interesting. I couldn't really say either way if a chess tournament would be exciting or not because I've never been to one. But I do know that for a filmmaker, capturing something as mundane as moving pieces back and forth on an 8x8 grid and making it appealing to chess fanatics and the average viewer alike would be a challenge. With that said, the show had my full attention from the first episode. So I wanted to do a deep dive on the camera techniques, lighting arrangement, video editing, acting, everything that denies you the right to look away from your preferred viewing platform. I avoid spoilers that relate to the overarching plot, so if you haven't seen the show yet, rest easy, and let this be my wholehearted endorsement of it. If you have seen it, I hope you find the little details just as interesting as I do. Let's start from the top. How do you start a show where the main protagonist's parents are dead or gone without immediately depressing your audience? Some directors would introduce a bit of magic to pique your curiosity. Others might curb the mood by singing the problems away. It's a hard knock life. And still others might opt to use both of those tactics. Do you want a bit of snowman? But those aren't really options here, so instead, director Scott Frank chooses to start at some other point in the story as if to say, don't worry, she'll get there eventually. And a little tease at the beginning is a pretty effective way at piquing your... <clears throat> curiosity? The narrative structure is mildly tossed around in another way too. Every so often we catch a glimpse of what life was like before living at the Methuen Home Orphanage for Girls. Rather than being upfront and telling it chronologically, they plant this seed in our heads. Who was Beth's mother and what were the events that led her to being orphaned? It stays in the back of our minds and slowly we piece it together. And if you want the picture to be complete, you'll stick around till the end. But we have yet to get to the actual game. The actual matches are filmed with unique styles that complement the theme and plot at that time. Take this game. Beth plays against Mr. Scheibel, one of her first matches ever played. And Mr. Scheibel says, You're gloating. Beth said nothing and has this almost blank expression on her face. So how can she be gloating? Look at the way she moves her pieces initially. And then again when she moves her pawn into a position that they both know will end with her victory. It's slower, more deliberate, and has more impact. She is taunting him, but it's subtle. It was close. I still beat you. Or he's just angry, however you choose to look at it. I'm not mad. Just play. But at some point, Beth has to grow up. And with that, she learns chess is more than just a game. But chess can also be... What? Beautiful. And what she means here is... Sexual. Seriously, here's a match that has more sexual tension than most romance films. First, the opening banter. Looks like we've been stalking each other. The exchange of looks. And the actual game, of course. Do you want to start my clock? Some moves are slow and deliberate, but gentle, not aggressive. Jesus Christ, Harmon, you're humiliating my rook. I think we can tell what Harmon's thinking about here. And the relief when it's finally over. Damn. Was it good for you? Oh, yeah. Big credit goes to the actors. Anya Taylor-Joy and Jacob Fortune Lloyd, with their subtle expressiveness 
and the director, Scott Frank, for putting it all together. If you can do that with a chess match on screen, you can pretty much do anything. Sometimes the credit has to go to the gaffers. I love this one scene where the light cuts the chessboard at a diagonal, putting both players in their own corner. Light shines on the player who's confident and currently in control of the match, whereas darkness envelops Beth who is nervous and for the first time suffering from losing the mental game. Everything her opponent does throws her off, showing up late, moves without hesitation, yawns. It's making it harder for her to think. And while acting and camera angles contribute to the atmosphere, I think it's the lighting that really drives the point home. And there are times when the moves are visualized on the board. A representation of Beth running through the moves in her mind akin to how a program might run through all the possibilities before finding the solution. Making her feel more like a superhero than a chess player. Not every match held the same weight though. One tournament was glossed over with a quick montage, which felt cheap to me, but possibly necessary for the sake of time. And some scenes were entertaining, but I imagine would never happen in a real chess tournament, like the theatrics of staring your opponent down from across the room, or impatiently tapping your foot at them while you wait for their next move. But Beth Harmon isn't just a chess prodigy. She's a person. After all, chess isn't the only thing in life. Choosing to show the side of her that is interested in boys, nice clothes, and socializing. And has the same problems ordinary people have with relationships, drugs, and puberty. Mom, I started my first period. Well, what do you know? Helps her be a bit more relatable. Before I close out here, there are a few little pieces I wanted to mention but couldn't find anywhere else to work into the script. Remember how I mentioned Harry Potter earlier? Well, this guy, Harry Melling, who used to play Dudley Dursley, is now playing Harry Beltic. Feel old yet? 36, but last year, last year I had 37. Beth Harmon was taught by a custodian to play chess. You resign now. Which reminded me of another film in which a child was taught karate by a repairman. Wax on, wax off. Interestingly enough, the karate kit was released in 1984, only a year after the Queen's Gambit novel was published, which the show was a faithful adaptation of. I'm not sure if one inspired the other, or if creators in the early 80s just had an inclination towards unlikely mentors. You've got your gift. And you've got what it costs. While I love this show, not every scene was perfect. My dad drank. Your eyes are just like his eyes. I really hope not. And the fact that they tried to make this stunning 24-year-old actress into a gawky 13-year-old girl? Actually, I'm a bit... Yes. That's right, I'm 13. Yeah, that, that threw me off too. There's more I could talk about, but I'd rather you find out for yourself. Before you go, there is this scene that's been bothering me, where the focus is on Benny Watts. He starts talking to Beth off screen, but the camera never cuts to her. It stays on Benny the entire time until he moves over, the camera panning with him. But why? It was obviously a conscious decision by the director, but what's the significance? Let me know your theories down in the comments. In the meantime, I'll be waiting.